Amen. Thank you, Brother Dalton. It was worth coming to church tonight for that. Didn't disappoint. Boy, the Lord is good to us. I'm so thankful what we believe in. Well, if you caught those words of that song, though the mountains are moved and cast into the sea. All right? No matter what happens around us, God stands supreme. God is not moved no matter who is in the White House and what sickness is going around the globe. God is supreme. I'm glad we can believe that. And the world needs to know what we believe. I'm glad that Brother Dalton can sing that like a man. It's a good song. If you don't like it, well, then maybe I don't like you. No, no, no. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm thankful for that song. Praise the Lord for that, that tremendous truth in that song. Thank you, Brother Dalton, for singing it. And listen, you come to church, it's okay to be moved when you come to church. Yeah. Lord works at church. He ought to work at church. Do we not pray that God would show up at church yeah. in the service? We sing, and we don't have just extra things in these services. It's not like as I get ready for Sunday, I'm like, oh, my goodness, my sermon's only 35 minutes long. What else will we do? Oh, let's sing a few songs. This will work. And, uh, oh, boy, I don't have enough illustrations, so we'll throw Brother Dalton in there to sing, too. That'll, that'll make it for some of the time. No. I believe that these things help us point our attention toward the Lord, encourage our hearts. I've often been moved during the song service of a church, and uh, my heart's prepared and open. I want these things to prepare us for the truth from God's Word. Have your Bibles, which I hope you do, open to Deuteronomy chapter number 6 tonight. Deuteronomy 6. We looked at this passage this morning and looked at just one word this morning, that first word in verse number 4 here, Shema. The Lord brings to our attention that word with the expectation that something would take place. You see, whenever God's word is preached, whenever God's word is read, whenever God's word is heard, it is not enough just to hear it or let it bounce off our eardrums. We must respond. And in fact, we always respond to it. We either accept it and believe it and obey it, or we ignore it and refuse it and reject it. I hope when you come to church that you don't refuse and reject God's Word. I hope when you open up God's Word in Scripture that you heed it and you hear it. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and of thy gates." And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware. When you're full, beware. When everything's going well, beware. When everything is just hunky-dory, when the bills are paid, when the kids are healthy, when you're on the climb at work, when the car is running smoothly in the house, nothing is broken, when the IRA account, the retirement account is full, when the fridge is stocked, beware. That's what he says. Then beware. Don't beware because of the enemies. God already promised the victory through those things. Don't beware because of the opposition. God had said it was going to come. He said, when you're in these houses that you didn't build, and there's full of things that you didn't buy, and you're, you're reaping the fruit of trees you didn't plant, you're drinking water from wells you didn't dig, then beware. Beware, what does it say? Lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight. Lord, we have just a few moments together. Lord, I pray that these moments would be profitable. 
I ask that your spirit would speak to us tonight. I ask you to use me. I pray that we'd be soil that would be good soil. And Lord, I ask that as you speak to us, that we would respond to you in obedience and humility. Lord, touch us tonight and change us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and following are, are a powerful portion of Scripture. I've heard messages preached on this passage. It is a powerful passage, powerful Scripture inside of the Jewish, current Jewish religion. The Shema, we looked at that this morning, talked about that this morning. Inside of this passage, a number of, of powerful statements that God gives to us. I believe the, how it starts here, just that word here, is and can be life-changing. If we can get the idea that every time God speaks, I'll do it, then what will stop us from pleasing Him? The answer is nothing. I've heard some tremendous testimonies about the Word of God. And people spending time in the Word of God. A few weeks back, I challenged everyone to spend the next 21 days in God's Word. And many, over 250 people, uh, uh, signed up and committed to doing that. George Mueller, a tremendous, a tremendous man of God, wrote about the necessity of Bible reading in his daily walk. He, he was able to read through the Bible over a hundred times. And after hitting that a hundred times through the Bible, Mark, he said this, I look upon it as a lost day when I do not have a good time over the Word of God. Friends often say to me, I have so much to do, so many people to see, I cannot find time for scripture study. Perhaps there are not many who have more to do than I, he says. George Mueller goes on to say, for more than half a century, I have never known one day when I had not more business than I could get through. For four years, I have had annually about 30,000 letters, and most of these have passed through mine own hands. I pastor a church with over 1,200 believers. Great has been their care. Besides this, I'm in charge of five orphanages, also a publishing depot, a printing and circulating of millions of tracts, books, and Bibles. But I've always made it a rule never to begin work until I've had a good season with God and his word the blessing that I have received has been wonderful the word of God this passage talks about how the word of God would be bound upon as frontlets before the eyes there's a little uh, piece that the Jews will wear called a phylactery in fact someone brought one to me after they heard me say that this morning a little phylactery it's a little box little box is often tied right around the forehead. If you'd open up this little box, I won't, you'll see tiny, tiny scrolls of the Word of God written on them. I was able a few years back in Birch Run, they had the Dead Sea Scroll exhibit. I went down to see it. Amazing ways that God has preserved His Word. In the Dead Sea Scroll exhibit, they had a piece of a scroll, ancient scroll that was from a phylactery, one of these things, a small piece. And on this was written with a, with a quill, the smallest type I think I have ever laid eyes on. It appeared to be smaller than you could even print off a laser printer. Amazing. And inside this, there's little scrolls in there. You can't see it from where you're at. And, and the, the Jews, a devout Jew, will, will bind this upon their head to make sure they're following to, right to the letter, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, frontlets before thine eyes. They want to make sure it's right here. But, but understand, my friend, the Word of God is not supposed to be bound here. It's supposed to be bound here. Many powerful statements in these verses and tonight I want to direct our attention to just one verse again one verse it's verse number seven the Bible says and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house when thou walkest by the way when thou liest down and when thou risest up there is a direct application to the parents in this room. For the next few months, I'll probably be spending some time, uh, maybe on a Wednesday night and things like that, about how as parents, there are a few things we must communicate to our children. 
Parents, there is a tremendous responsibility, especially in this day and age, to communicate truth to our children. That God has put in our hands our stewardship for just a brief amount of time. I am not raising my children to live in my house forever. I love them, and some days I even like them. But there are other days I like them while they're somewhere else. Today, my wife and I got to eat lunch, just the two of us. My dad took the kids for lunch. Did you miss your children? They came back. <laughs> now, I love my children, but I'm raising them to serve the Lord. I want them to go off and serve God, whether he calls them to work in a full-time ministry like, like I do, or, or whether he calls like many of you to work in a job and serve him on Sundays and Saturdays, other days of the week, either way, but to serve the Lord every single day of their life. Whatever God calls them to do. And listen, there is not one position that's more important, all right? Someone's not more important because they happen to get paid by a church. I'm not more important than you, and you're not more important than me. As long as we serve God, we're important in His economy. There are people that you can reach where you work that I'll never talk to. God has called you to be there and to be light and salt in that environment. God has called me here to be the pastor. It's just what God has called us to do. Follow God. And parents, we're supposed to instill these truths to our children. There's a whole sermon inside of that, but I don't believe that's the direct point of verse number 7. It says to communicate this, thou shalt teach them diligent, diligently unto thy children. But understand, inside of this verse, there's a few different ways, and that's why I believe it goes much deeper than, at first glance, what we see. There are a few things that you should never buy off-brand. Now, I'm not advocating spending extra money in life, but there are a few things that you should not waste your money on. Many things, it seems not to matter, whether you buy Pillsbury flour or great value flour doesn't seem to matter. Maybe some of you will argue with me afterwards and I'll let you have your point. I, I will concede. But I'll give you a couple things you should never buy off brand a Big Mac. There's only one Big Mac. It's found at McDonald's, like it or hate it, you only find the Big Mac at McDonald's. But you know there's a restaurant or there's a, there's a gas station down in Ohio that sells a Big MacDougal burger? I've never had it. If you happen to pass through Ohio, if you go to Ohio, if you're from Ohio, don't bring me back one. I don't want one. There are some things you should never buy off-brand. Some candy called... Uh, Kit Kats, you familiar with Kit Kat? Mm-hmm. I saw this, another brand called the Cot Cat. I don't know what that is, but I know I don't want it. But probably the greatest piece of food that you should never buy off-brand, and I think I could find universal agreement with this, is you should never buy off-brand Oreos. There's only one kind of Oreo, and it's called Oreo. I found some other brands of Oreos. They're called Cream Betweens, Sandwich Cremos, and Walmart Great, Great Value sells Twist and Shout. Yeah, I'll shout all right. I'll shout when I realize this isn't a real Oreo. I, want, I don't know what they do with those Oreos, how they make them, but they're different, aren't they? They're different. And in my humble opinion, they're much better. But something else that we should never do off-brand, and that's our relationship with Jesus Christ. There is no place for counterfeit or cheap imitations. Tonight I want to challenge us to be, before God, authentic. You know why some children, you know why sometimes co-workers, you know why sometimes family members don't turn to God? Because they don't see the real deal. I'm not blaming every co-worker who doesn't get saved, every spouse or every child who doesn't turn out in that regard. I'm just saying sometimes people are turned off 
to God and Christianity because they don't see the real deal. They don't see authenticity. They don't see an authentic, authentic Christian. They see a cheap knockoff. Sometimes we struggle because what's at church is not at home. What's at home may be real. What's at church? Not so much. We miss the mark because sometimes what is seen outside is not what's inside. And don't forget that Jesus said what's inside is what really matters. He said the outside matters too. He never said it doesn't matter out here, but he said I look deeper than just what you have on the outside. You may look okay, but I see right through you. I see if you're genuine, if you're real, if you're authentic or not. And God wants us to be authentic. This year, we're presenting the idea of only God. And I'm challenging us tonight to be authentic. Only God at the center of your life. Only God at the center of your universe. What causes you anxiety and anger and angst and worry? Sometimes it's when your children are mistreated. Sometimes it's when we're mistreated. Sometimes it's when our expectations are not met or our little God is knocked down. We are called to be authentic and to be the real deal. Amen. Heard the expression, face the music before? Many years ago, there was a man who wanted to play in the Imperial Orchestra, but he couldn't play a single note. But he had a lot of money and influence. Went to the conductor, and apparently he said, I'd like to play an instrument. And so because of his influence of, uh, of people and because of his wealth, his do generous donations, the conductor agreed to let him sit in the second row of the orchestra, and they gave him a flute. Why? It's not my story. It said that when the concert would begin, he would raise the flute to his lips, he would pucker his lips and move his fingers, and no one would know besides those in the orchestra. They would play before the king, and the, the king and never, never knew, and he played concert after concert with the orchestra. Well, one day, the conductor who was there passed away, and a new conductor came into town. The new conductor came into town and he said, I want to hear everyone play and see if you fit inside my vision and my uh, expectation for the orchestra. And one by one, the players began to play for the brand new conductor. Apparently this man, who was a complete and utter fake, got out of playing for many, many days. He pretended to be sick. And had doctor excuse after doctor excuse. But finally, the conductor called the doctor and said, Is he fine? And finally he had to stand before the conductor. And when he pulled up the flute, everything was known. He was a complete and utter fraud. He had to, quote, face the music. And my friend, one day we will stand before God Almighty. And we may pretend right now, we may have the instrument of Christianity in our hands, and every time that the music begins to play, we may adopt the right things to say and the right actions and the right clothes to wear. But God knows if we are truly authentic and real or if we're nothing but a fake. Authentic Christianity, have a heart for God. A heart for God requires that we move from the externals to the internals. Playing church is not church. Playing a Christian is not a Christian. Growing up, we played different games. Cops and robbers was one of them. I played that game many times. I'm still not a police officer. Move from the externals to internals that we reject the easy way of ritual and habit and develop a vibrant relationship with Christ at the very core. I want to give us tonight three ways from verse number 7 that God requires us and expects us to be real. The first way is this. Look at the verse. He wants us to be real at home. Look what he says there. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. 
I wonder, my friend, if tonight, before God Almighty, if you are real at home. I'm talking about real to those who know you the best, to those who are closest to you. A real Christian will be known to be real by their family. Wives, is your husband real? I'm not asking if he's perfect, but I'm asking if he's real. Husbands, is your wife a real Christian? Moms, is your kid, are they a real Christian? Young people, are you real? Are you real at home? Sometimes over the years when I was principal at Bridgeport Baptist Academy, the kids were honestly very, very good for us most of the time. Small little problems along the way, but most times very, very good. But every once in a while, a, a parent would say, well, you don't see my child at home. It's true. I'm glad I don't. I would want to respond, and you don't see them at school. I didn't. I bit that back. What, what is it like at home? One time a Sunday school teacher asked their first grade class if anyone could describe a Christian. And a little boy raised his hand. Always a dangerous thing in first grade Sunday school. Always dangerous. Those teachers, all right, they have a lot of knowledge about you. More than you want to know. Pray for mommy, pray for daddy, and who knows what will come out of their lips next. Our teachers are good teachers. A little boy raised his hand and he stated, Christians are nice people who never complain, argue, or talk back. He then added, my daddy is a good Christian, but my mommy isn't. <laughs> oh, that was not here at First Baptist Church. If that happened here, I would not say that out loud. No, I don't believe everything children who are in the first grade say. But I wonder, I just wonder if that question was posed to your first grader, what their answer would be. Speak of these truths when thou sittest in thine house. You see, the reason that we have to be real at home is it doesn't matter what we say. It matters what we do. You see, God was not just saying, hey, make sure you give the truth because if you say one thing and do something else, your kids will reject what you say. He wants us to be authentic at home, the real deal at home. Don't be a cheap knockoff in your house. Sure, you're nice at church, nice smile on your face, looking nice, bringing the biggest Bible you can find. And I'm glad for all of that. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you sing. I'm glad you say amen. But I'd be really glad if you're real at home. And if those closest to you would see that. If you're put on trial for Jesus Christ, would there be any witnesses? Daniel was put on trial. And there were some witnesses against him. We know Daniel at home. We can see him in his house, real at home. You see, we're supposed to be real at home, and real is known by those closest to it. Real teaches truth to other people. The Bible in the book of Hebrews says this, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now we understand the word provoke. Or at least those of us who have a sibling understand the word provoke. I was blessed with six of them. I liked six of them. I knew how to provoke. Push the buttons. I knew how to get them in trouble. Don't look at me like I'm a pagan. You know what I'm talking about. I know how to get them so that my mom and dad would get mad at them. And I wasn't doing anything. What? I'm not doing anything. Oh, don't look at me like that. Oh, no, please. Please. You know exactly what I'm saying. We know how to provoke. You know how to provoke each other. All you do, husbands, you know how to provoke your wives and wives your husbands. You know that. And the Bible challenges us to provoke not to anger, not to irritation, but to love and to good works. You see, real at home is known by those closest to them. It's also teaching others something else. Diligently to prick, to confront. That means that a, that a real dad 
will teach the truth and not be afraid of confrontation in his home. That's a real man of God. They say, listen, this is the way it needs to be. I'm not talking about being a jerk. I'm not talking about being rude and mean. But I say, listen, this is the way. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Real. Consistent. Be consistent. Not up and down. One mark of, of, a, of a mature Christian is a consistent emotional state. If your life is like a roller coaster, like this, you need to become mature in Jesus Christ. Maturity brings consistency. Real at home, but it goes beyond that. Look at verse 7 again, if you could. When thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way. Not only should we be real at home, we're supposed to be real in front of others. The idea is that, listen, we're going to teach this truth, and I'm going to teach it when I sit down at home. But now we're out and about. Now we're walking down the street. Now we're in the grocery store. Now we're driving down the street. Now we're among other people, and I'm supposed to teach the same truth again. That means I need to be real in front of other people. That means I'm going to be real and authentic and honest on my taxes, honest on my groceries, honest when I find money. I found some money a little while back at the bank and I turned it into the teller. It wasn't my money. Apparently, as I found out, it was another local pastor's money. Didn't know whose it was. I turned it back in. Apparently, they talked to me the other day and said, boy, I like that guy. Never met this man before ever. Never met him since before or after that. But he said, he's on, he said of me, he's honest. And all I did, all I did was what, was what you would do. There's some money on the ground, and it's not mine. So I turned it in. We got to be real. We got to be honest. It means if you get mischarged, you say, listen, I'm sorry you charged me the wrong, the wrong amount. It's happened to me. The other day I was buying something and the lady misrang something to my benefit of over $65. Now, I'll take $65 any day of the week. It will not change my life. All right, I can't pay off my house. I can't buy another vehicle. All right, I can go to a restaurant and get a drive through or pick up. All right, not eat inside. But I told her, I said, I'm not sure that's right. And she goes, oh, Wow. Honest, real in front of others. Do your coworkers know you're real? Recently, I heard about this that a man went to a good Christian college. He was at a, well, this past week, he was at a seminar. In fact, this particular individual in some productions played at Jesus, part of Jesus. This past week in the seminar, a secular seminar, just doing like a business thing, was swearing. According to what I was told, dropping the F-bomb. The man who heard it said, it's kind of disconcerting to, to hear Jesus say that word. But my friend, are you real in front of others? Because it's kind of disconcerting. When Jesus Christ, who lives inside of you and me, and we're Christians, don't live that way. Real in front of others. Perfection's not expected, but authenticity is. If you make a mistake, which we all will, and a just man falls seven times, yet riseth up again. If you make a mistake, you can apologize. You can say to your wife, to your husband, to your kids, to your family, to your church, it doesn't matter. Say, listen, I, I blew it. I'm sorry. Perfection's not expected, authenticity is. Perfection's not required, but humility is. I was encouraged last night in prayer meeting. One of the men in prayer meeting mentioned he's been able to witness at work because some of the men around him are bothered by what's going on and they know he's a Christian. Who knows you're a Christian? Real at home, real in front of others. Look at that verse one more time, briefly. Very last phrase. And when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. You know what he means by that? Real each day. When you get up, 
When you lie down, you're real. He says, listen, communicate this truth at home. Your kids are going to see you. C communicate this truth when you're out and about. You're going to be seen. And every single day when you get up, when you lie down, you're doing the same thing. You are real. You're authentic every single day. Stories told when the Queen of Sheba, and it's just a story, it's not found in God's Word, but when the Queen of Sheba went to visit Solomon. The Bible says she asked him many questions, and he answered all of them. Well, someone wrote a story and said, well, one question that she asked, and it's extra biblical, it's not non-biblical, but she said, Solomon, you're the wisest man in the world. I have brought some real flowers. I have brought some, flake, some fake flowers. Tell me which ones are real and which ones are fake, but you may not touch them or smell them. As the story goes about Solomon, who the Bible says was the wisest man who ever lived because God gave him wisdom. Story says that Solomon pondered for a moment and then said, Go and open the window. And he said, The bees will come in and watch where the bees land. You see, when the window's open, it'll be seen whether you and I are authentic or whether we're fake. A small child sitting in church asked his father, Dad, what's a Christian? The father replied, A Christian is a person who loves and obeys God. He loves his friends and neighbors and even his enemies. He prays often, is kind and gentle and holy and is more interested in going to heaven than all earthly riches. That son is a Christian. And the boy looked puzzled for a moment. He said, Dad, have I ever seen one? There's a pastor interviewed a young alcoholic. He'd formerly been an active church member, but he traded church for AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. He replaced the church. And this pastor asked this man who had replaced church with AA why he had done that. And this man said, in this particular case, AA helps me in that struggle far better than my church. The pastor asked and was troubled by that, by that statement. And he said, well, name one quality missing in the church that AA somehow supplies. The young man said dependency. He said, in his impression, most people at my church gave off a, a self-satisfied air of superiority. They didn't sense them consciously leaning on God or each other. They were just doing their own thing. Or can I say it this way? You know what he saw? Cheap imitation. My friend tonight, are you authentic? Are you real? Or are you just a knockoff? Now the wonderful thing is tonight, we can come back to the Lord. And we say, God, I need to be real at home. I need to be real in front of others. God, I want to be real, not a fake. Maybe you need to apologize to your spouse, to your kids, to your parents. Say, I've been fake. But God calls us. God expects us to be real. The real deal. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, you did not save us just so we could live a nice life. Lord, you saved us to walk with you. Lord, I ask you tonight that you'd search our hearts. Try us. Know our thoughts. And Lord, see if there be any wicked way. I wonder tonight, my friend, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder not if you're perfect. That's not the expectation or the requirement. But to be authentic is. I wonder who would say, Pastor, tonight while you spoke, God spoke to me. I'm afraid that maybe at home or at work, I'm a bit of a knockoff. I don't want to be that knockoff. I want to be authentic. 
one who would say tonight, Pastor, that's me. Would you pray for me? I want to be real. I need to be real. Perfection's not expected, but humility is. Who else with these hands? I want to be real. I want to be real at home. I see those hands. Who else? In just a moment, we'll stand to our feet, and if God's touched your heart, you move. Would you be real? God, bless this time. May our hearts be touched and challenged by your word, by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.